set aside We talked about the state of health care. Is health care overall, the overall delivery of health care in the United States today, is it better or worse than it was eight years ago? Who wants to go first? Dr. Krauss. It's both. Uh, it's better because we have this incredible, never-ending series of advances in medical science and technology. Uh, we see patients today uh, with cancer cures that are unimaginable. We see patients today who have had their heretofore fatal cancers converted into treatable chronic diseases. Uh, we see a variety of uh, new surgical technologies, uh, brain implants. Uh, we're on the frontier of stem cell uh, techniques to regenerate organs, to rejuvenate people. So what we have available to us in terms of medical science and technology is incredibly exciting. The frustration on the other hand is that we're worse in other ways. There was a time when two people made healthcare decisions, a doctor and a patient. Uh, when I'm in my office nowadays, I tend to think that although the office room is not any bigger than it was, that there are 32 people in there all at the same time. Uh, that there's a representative of the federal government, there's a representative of the state government, there's a representative of the LA tax division, there's a representative of the Department of uh, Health, uh, there's a quality assurance representative from whatever third party payer represents that patient. Uh, it's no longer a decision process that's founded on this relationship between one physician and one patient. And the problem with that is it creates a terrible inefficiency in our trying to take care of patients. Uh, it used to be that a physician's time was spent taking care of patients. It's a small minority of a physician's time today that's spent taking care of patients. And the worst part of that is it's also a small portion of the health care dollar that's spent on patients. If you look at the amount that's taken off the top to support health plans and health insurance companies, if you look at the amount that's taken off the top because we're all in a position of having to practice defensive medicine, and people say, well, you know, the cost, uh, the cost of medical liability insurance is so small, the cost of judgments are so small, you know, it's dust, why are you talking about it? Well, it's not a small cost when somebody's going to order an MRI for a patient with a headache because they're worried that a tumor will be incidentally discovered two or three years later, and this visit will be reflected on as practice beneath the standard of care or negligent care because an MRI wasn't done. So we certainly need lots of things to be done to make our health care system better. Uh, we need tort reform. It would be good to move to a system where there is a national compensation board, just as there is for vaccine injury, for health care injury. Uh, we need to have the health care dollar spent more efficiently. We need to have those that administer health care and pay for health care to be able to do that without taking so much of the health care dollar. Uh, we need to get rid of unnecessary care. Uh, unnecessary care is partly the practice of defensive medicine, but there are others that may be telling patients that they need to have services that they may, need to, may not need to have. And we need to have some business-minded person look at return on investment. Nobody's looking at the fact that we spend $3.1 trillion but the quality of product that we're producing for that may be inferior to what's available in lots of other healthcare systems. So maybe there are certain things that we're spending a lot of money on that don't produce a significant return on investment in terms of months of quality of life added. Uh, and nobody likes to use the word rationing. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a appointed regulator, You'll never hear someone in government use the word rationing, but we are living with rationing today. We are living with a system where the health insurance company won't let us do what we feel we need to do to take care of our patients, uh, living with a system where CMS doesn't let us adequately care for our patients who have Medicare or Medicaid. So we live with rationing every day. Well, instead of rationing, why don't we come up with some rational methodology to look at return on investment and to look at efficiency of care. 
so that we can spend 90 cents of every health care dollar on the delivery of health care instead of 15 cents. And I implore every physician to get involved because if we don't get involved and we don't help solve this problem, the solution is going to be weighed upon us and we probably won't like it. So Dr. Krauss has said things are both better and worse. Who would like to comment? Any on the side of better only? No. Well, I, Dr. I, Russo. I, would, I would have to say I think that overall it's better. Um, I think the, the promise of access to care, uh, as uh, Mr. Obama has provided that, but I think it's mostly a promise at this point based on all, everything I said before, because I'm not sure with a $6,000 deductible and somebody living at the margin that that really is anything more than a promise. But before, um, you know, multiple presidents, going back to Teddy Roosevelt, frankly, were, were not able to give, a, give us a, uh, a universal health care system. Not that we have it now, but at least we're closer than it was. The technology is great. We're doing lots of things. Hepatitis C is a wonderful example of how we're stamping out a disease that causes, you know, uh, hepatic cancer as well as hepatitis C and cirrhosis, but you know it's not available at $100,000 of uh, a treatment cycle or $80,000 of a treatment cycle. There's many people on the margin who are not going to be able to afford the copays for that. And how are the health plans going to pay for that? How are they going to ration it? Who's going to make that decision? I think you know that that shows up in the newspaper most every day. So uh, in that regard, yeah. You know, we've we've built a we built a box that's difficult to get out of. Okay, but it's there, it's available. If if we can come to terms with the the people who are pr producing that product to make it available at a reasonable price um, uh, for Americans, not just for all the other countries that get dis uh, huge steep discounts on these kinds of things. Um, you know, device technology is moving along. We're now putting uh, aortic valves in people uh, through a single puncture site. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of old people with calcific aortic stenosis that were disabled that are now can, you know, can, can walk down the street with their grandchildren and so forth and so on. So I don't really see that we're much worse off, but some of the, some of the uh, availabilities is still a promise to folks. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thank you. Who else would like to comment, so better or worse? I mean, if you set aside the technological advancements, the amazing discoveries in medical research, the amazing things we can do for patients, and you talk about physicians' lives and the practice of medicine, it's worse. If you talk to your average physician, particularly your primary care physician, they're tired, they're burnt out, and they're dismayed. They cannot talk to their patients, they're typing. They're busy looking at their computer screen. It amazes me how often patients say to me, Dr. Azis, you're an amazing typist. They didn't <laughs> go to medical school to become a typist. <laughs> you know, and, and that's frequently a significant part of my job now is being a secretary. I didn't go to medical school to become a secretary. So the um, onerous regulations, the um, push to go to an electronic health care record, whether it's better for patient care or not better for patient care, the inability for us to prescribe the medicines that our patients need and deserve without having to worry that we're going to get a call from the pharmacy saying this isn't covered what would you like us to give them instead without our having any knowledge of what every single plan's individual formulary is it it all piles up and that's why physicians are disillusioned they're burned out and they're exhausted so Access to medical care is not just a funding issue. Access to medical care is having joyful practitioners taking care of you. That's a very important part of access to care. And if there's anything that the medical association has to do, it has to get the message out that doctors need help. And they need help dealing with what's being put upon them from above by government. It's not being put upon them by patients. Patients come in with individual problems that we can easily grapple with, that we can help them with, that we can resolve most times. What we can't resolve is the morass that surrounds this 
um, that we have to deal with. So, so when Dr. Krauss says that you know he spends a good part of his time dealing with other issues, those other issues are the are the regulations and the rules and the documentation requirements and all sorts of stuff that really impacts the the quality of care we give our patients. And the trend line is for more regulation. Right. Trend not line less. is worse. In fact, if you look, there's a there, there's a very well known graph that shows cost of medical care rising sort of like this at a very slow level. And if you look at the administrative costs, they go up like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what we have to I grapple with. I saw that the other day. Yeah. I'd like to make, I'd like to address the issue related to um, um, health care being worse. From the perspective of, I think the ACA was very important in number one, um, uh, putting insurance in place for people who may have lost insurance for whatever reason, or people who are already engaged in the healthcare system. I think for a certain population, uh, it has been worse uh, because many of the doctors who practice in uh, minority communities or ethnic communities have been provided, uh, well, whatever community, because even Dr. Krauss um, uh, um, confessed that he <laughs> provided free services, pro bono services to patients. Um, once uh, their patients were enrolled in a particular health plan, all of a sudden they were removed from the care of their primary care physician, people that they had known all of their lives. And so it actually served to interrupt care and certainly challenge quality. Now I've heard uh, the caveat that you can utilize nurse practitioners or PAs or physician extenders in whatever capacity and that does allow one to uh, touch more patients. However, if you think in terms of health disparities that usually um, pertains to a particular population that doesn't have access either to primary care services or specialist services. And so just because you put a lower level practitioner in place doesn't necessarily mean you're providing good quality care. And help me understand why in the most health disparate regions it's okay to do that when perhaps it may not be okay elsewhere. And so in many ways, I think that it has uh, worsened access to care as relates to patients having or maintaining a very valuable relationship with their primary care physician or specialist. Thank you. Dr. Curian? So, you know, um, although all these issues exist, and I'm not trying to say that they don't, um, when you look at sort of the downstream consequences of all of this, um, one of the interesting things, like what I mentioned earlier, are these mortality rates, that we've seen you know, significant improvement in these trends across all of the major um, key, key issues, you know, cardiovascular disease, COPD, um, stroke, all of it is getting better if you look at what's happened over the last 10 years. So some things, you know, going right. Something's going right. <laughs> Something's yeah. working. Right. Um, which is a good thing. Uh, of course, you know, there's consequences to trying to make it work, like you were talking about physician burnout. And so everything that you have to try and do to make things better um, may be still very problematic. Um, what I see is things are different. So although these mortality trends are improving, one of the things that's interesting to note is that we're seeing a shift in some of the causes of mortality. So right now we're dealing with a huge opioid crisis. And um, interestingly, it's not the typical minorities that are really facing this issue. It's uh, primarily impacting white, middle-aged, uneducated individuals. So we're seeing sort of a shift in, in what's really impacting society and what are the the major issues that we're having to deal with. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say things are completely better or worse, but they are different and they're changing and moving in a different direction. Dr. Sheba? Yeah, I definitely recognize and agree on how difficult it's been for many in medicine in terms of ACA. But I think again of my friend's husband who literally was limping, could not get by in life, 
you know, had this horrible hip pain, didn't want to go out, and his wife telling me he had his hip surgery and he can go on hikes on me, he doesn't have pain anymore. So despite all that, I, I literally think about how ACA has really changed the lives of people that I know personally. And that is what strikes me about the good that has come along. Yes, Dr. Cross. Dr. Kurian touched on a few very important things. Um, earlier, you noted that $3.2 million that was dedicated to the Department of Public Health for preventative care has evaporated. You know, when I was in grade school, I learned aphorisms. I learned an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I learned, learned a stitch in time saves nine. And when I reflect on American health care today, it's almost as if it's all emergency care. It's, it's save me care. I've got chest pain, prevent me from having a fatal heart attack. Uh, I've got inability to move my arm, save me from the stroke, save me from this. I don't think that we're spending enough time focusing on preventative care. Uh, and again, those people who are funneling in that $3.2 trillion of the healthcare dollar need to find some effective means of apportioning an adequate amount of money for preventative care. You speak of the decline in the mortality rate of cardiovascular disease and stroke and COPD. It probably has nothing to do with a physician giving anybody a pill, although statins are helpful, as much as it has to do with the decline in the incidence of smoking. So things that we can do and influence to improve the environment, to have people have a, a better diet and a better level of activity uh, to prevent these costly diseases need to be paid attention to. And, and I don't see that our healthcare system is doing that adequately. Dr. Shiva. Yeah, I would love to comment on that. I think there, you know, obviously if there's any kind of a shift in terms of looking more at population health and what are the social determinants of health mm -hmm. is definitely a way that we should definitely be moving in. I think when you try to tell someone that you really need to take your medication, you know, you have a physician saying you really need to, but they just can't afford it. Maybe they don't have the transportation to get to the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Their wheelchair is broken. Uh, you know, you tell, you know, young adults, you need to really exercise. You know, it's, you know, we need to fight obesity, but maybe the neighborhoods that they live in aren't very safe for them to run around. So I think the more and more that our health system focuses on the social determinants of health, the better off we'll be. Mm -hmm.